Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, Hawaii gun control, too much regulation or too little? Aloha and welcome to Insights. I'm Daryl Huff with Hawaii News Now for Insights on PBS Hawaii. It's been nearly 15 years since Byron Uesugi killed seven co-workers in Hawaii's last mass shooting. Many credit Hawaii's strict gun control laws with relatively low incidence of gun-related crime. But others think that Hawaii's laws are too prohibitive and could be relaxed without harm. And rising gun re registration numbers indicate that Hawaii residents don't want to give up guns anytime soon. Do we have too much or too little gun ownership regulation in Hawaii. We invite you to join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Now to our panel. Harvey Gerwig is the president of the Hawaii Rifle Association, which represents the National Rifle Association in Hawaii. The nonprofit organization supports gun ownership and training for individuals who want to use firearms for sport and defense. Peter Carlisle was Honolulu's 13th mayor and third elected prosecutor, now in private practice. Mr. Carlisle continues to advocate for stricter gun control laws in Hawaii. Bill Richter is the Hawaii chapter president of LIFE, or Lessons in Firearms Education. LIFE offers training in safe ownership and use of firearms based on National Rifle Association training materials and relevant Hawaii laws. And finally, David Louie was the state attorney general under former Governor Neil Abercrombie. During his tenure, which ended just last month, he fought to tighten state and national loopholes that would allow people to obtain guns without proper background checks. Now, let me start with uh, Bill Richter. You know, Hawaii does have a very low uh, gun ownership rate and also a very low death rate from guns. Can't we give gun control credit for that, for saving lives? Well, I, th I think that's going to that difference between causation and correlation uh, to contrast it with, say, Vermont uh, on the East Coast. Vermont has virtually no regulations uh, pertaining to guns and carrying them, uh, and they also have a very, uh, very low homicide and gun incident rate, uh, whereas places like Chicago, Washington, D.C. all have very restrictive gun control laws, and yet they have a much higher murder rate. Let me just us. quickly bounce a statistic off you, though. The, the <coughs> state with the highest gun death rate, now we're not talking about homicide, Homicide. There's a number of ways you can die from a gun. Uh, is about 20 percent. 62 percent of the families in Wyoming have guns. In Hawaii, only 9.7 percent of families have guns, and the death rate is 3.67 percent. It's less than a fifth of, of what it is in that state. Uh, let me try, Harvey. How do you feel about that? It, isn't it tell us that the gun control is making us safer here? I don't think I buy that argument. <clears throat> um, <laughs> The, there are, by the by, the count of of our own police chief, over a million firearms in the state of Hawaii. And how many people do we have in this state? A million, one, a million, two, and a lot of those, a lot of the count in that million from the police chief is does not count for unregistered firearms that weren't registered prior to 1994. So we have a very high. Uh, occurrence of, of firearm ownership here, higher than what the stats, I believe, would, would indicate. David Louis, uh, your response to that? Do you, do you feel like it, these statistics are, are basically proof that gun control is working here? I, I think gun control is working here. Um, but but I, whether it's a, a cause and effect uh, is for a, a lot of different people to debate. I think it's a public policy uh, argument, and it, it, and it makes sense for our state uh, to be restrictive, as we have, uh, to make sure that people who have firearms register them, to make sure that people who want to get firearms have background checks so that we can uh, exclude felons, mentally ill uh, people, people who have been adjudicated with mental uh, problems, people who have domestic violence problems, all the high-risk categories that you don't want to put a gun in the hand of somebody who is volatile because it threatens public safety, it threatens the general public and for mentally ill people it threatens them too because sometimes they use it on themselves so I think our laws are quite frankly it's a Goldilocks law I think our laws are just right uh, as they are um, uh, Mr. Carlisle in terms of let me just I'd like to explore this a little bit it is a very Harvey seems to be saying something different but it, we seem to 
I mean, it seems like we have a lot fewer guns here. Do you agree that that's maybe a statistical thing and that we actually don't have that much? I don't know how it's distributed amongst the population. It could be that there's a lot of people who own collections. It could not be that. I don't know. But the, the important point to remember about having a gun that's involved in any incident is that it makes it easy to kill people. Okay? It's not easy to kill people with your hands. It's not easy to kill people with a knife. With a gun, unfortunately, it's very easy to do. So we do not have in Hawaii a gun culture. Uh, we don't have people who are just longing and dying to go running around with guns on their pockets and in their, you know, in their cars loaded up and ready to go. It's just not the way people behave here. So I think we have a tremendous advantage over other places. Vermont, I would say, has uh, an advantage largely because there's not a whole lot of people and there's a whole lot of space and the, the real gun problems occur in the big cities where people are sort of stuffed and packed in on each other and their gang cultures. And we don't really have a gang culture and Vermont has a minuscule gang culture. So uh, I think Rector, those are issues. Would you like to respond? I'll bring it back around to you. About once again, this is very low gun ownership rate, um, very low gun death rate. I mean, aren't aren't those things related? Uh, again, I, you talk about causation versus correlation, and when you talk about statistics, you have to determine whether or not it's actually a causative factor or whether or not it just happens coincidentally along that same line. Do you agree that there's fewer guns here than in most places, and and what would you attribute that to? Uh, Again, I think our culture here in Hawaii has not been a big, big gun culture. And uh, why do you think so? Um, well, in part, uh, it stems from uh, actions that occurred back in 1934 when Hawaii instituted uh, gun laws in relation to a labor action at Honolulu Harbor. Uh, there's always been an effort. Gun control is not necessarily about gun control. It's about controlling those other people. And in Hawaii, it was controlling the laborers that were trying to protest and trying to uh, picket and otherwise disrupt the functions uh, in the harbor. Uh, so the easiest way to keep control of those guys is to remove the possibility that they could uh, use lethal force uh, against an oppressive uh, party. Um, and that's the history of gun control all the way back to the southern regions in Reconstruction. So Let me ask uh, David Louie, do you think that that's even relevant today? Um, you know, the historical roots are always uh, a basis for how you got to a particular place. But the question to me is, is evaluating whether our gun control laws are appropriate or not is just to look at what's happening on the ground now and making the public policy decisions as to does this make sense? Uh, are we doing a good job? I mean, I wouldn't want to see a relaxation of uh, the laws that we have that would allow people open carry, concealed carry, unlimited carry. Uh, somehow, I think having guys walking around with eight AK-47s or assault rifles or uh, pistols uh, on the beach at Waikiki would not be in keeping with the Aloha spirit and would not be good for tourism. Uh, Harvey uh, uh, Gerwig, are you folks advocating that in absolutely. Hawaii? <clears throat> in Hawaii, when, yeah, absolutely. When when you look at all the all the states and all the cities across the nation, the vast preponderance of them have concealed carry and or open carry or both. Um, there are not problems with it. You don't have fights in the street, you don't have gang, not, not gang wars, you don't have uh, Wild West stuff going on. There are no problems. And, and we're sort of astonished at the attitude of this government here that, no, you can't exercise your constitutional right. We have the constitutional right to be able to protect ourselves. And we're finding the court cases are falling in the favor of that, of that uh, premise across the country. The Ninth Circuit has just been, has just been knocking down uh, won't issue or may issue. We're, we are a may issue, meaning that the police chief has total discretion as to whether, when I come in and say, I would like to carry a firearm, he has complete discretion of yes, you can, no, you can't. That's what may issue is. Most states are shall issue. If you're, uh, if you're not a felon, you're not mentally disabled, you walk into the police station and you say, I would like a permit to carry, later and on, they issue it. Later on, we're gonna go back and we'll talk a little bit more about detail by detail through the law. We're getting some questions now if people have specific questions and we can go into some okay. of that. Sure. But uh, Peter Carla, I'm wondering, your response to this, this image that's been lift, uh, raised up here of people packing pistols in their swim shorts on Waikiki Beach. Well, I can tell you one incident where it occurred, and the fact that they had a very sophisticated weapon created all sorts of problems was the Uesugi case. I mean, he got, was able to get there without being noticed because he stuffed his best gun for the job at hand, you know, in his pants, 
and then took it out and started blasting away at seven people who never had a chance. So, I mean, if he had tried to go in there with a knife, if he had tried to go there in there with a baseball club, some of those guys had military backgrounds. I would suspect that they would have been able to compromise his. Do you intent. think that either of you gentlemen, if uh, if Hawaii had a law that allowed uh, concealed carry, do you think there's a chance that one of his coworkers might have had a gun with them? Absolutely. Certainly. That would be your guys' answer oh, to that statement. You know, it's interesting to note that uh, all of this doom and gloom about concealed carry or even open carry coming from generally law enforcement and that particular side, particularly the higher ups in law enforcement, um, always talk about the, the, the blood in the street aspect of it. Every single state that is in enacted uh, looser concealed carry uh, laws have not had that happen. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, police officials from Florida to Texas to Oklahoma have all gone on record that said, I oppose this initially because of all these concerns, and you know what? It's really not an issue. Just recently, Illinois, the last state in the nation to not allow concealed carry, last year passed concealed carry. There have not been any of those instances of, of shootouts over parking spaces or any of the other nonsense that seems to be uh, propagated from the, the higher ups in law enforcement. L let's roll back a little bit because I want the public to be educated about what our laws are and why they are so much different. We've talked about concealed carry. You're saying we're the last state in the to country to be this restrictive about concealed carry? Is that what you're saying? Well, there are three types of ways that you can carry a firearm, or, or there's three mechanisms. You can either have what's called constitutional carry, meaning the government is not required. You don't have to go to the government and get a permission slip, if you will, in order to carry a firearm, either openly or, or concealed. There's may issue, which means that some bureaucrat has the discretionary ability to deny somebody the ability to carry. And then there's a shall issue that Harvey mentioned earlier. Shall issue simply means that once you've met the objective criteria and you're not otherwise a prohibited person, you have to be issued a, a, a concealed carry permit that allows you to carry that firearm concealed. Okay, and we already mentioned that we have a May issue, but yeah. we also have a policy that seems in the department to be extremely restrictive. Or is actually, that, let, is me, that let, okay. let me talk about that. The stats are actually the exact opposite of that. Um, in the last two years, uh, because people, uh, gun owners and people who wanted to get guns perceived that there was going to be some kind of a clampdown, the gun registrations spoke Spiked. Uh, we got 22,000 applications in 2012. We got 21,000 in in uh, 2013. Uh, I mean, it was it was huge. Uh, it went up by about 300 percent. Okay, one percent of the applications were denied, and they were denied for felons, uh, mental health. Uh, domestic violence, all of the things that are normally done. So, so if somebody's going to say, oh, we're, the sky's falling, we're denying these permits because the police chiefs are acting in some capricious or arbitrary way. That's just not true. It's not happening. Well, but those, are are to, those are applications to, to own a firearm, not, not to, to carry. carry it. Totally different thing, David. Right. We, and we, we bar carry. Okay, we bar open carry here, and I, I quite frankly agree with that. There are good, solid public policy reasons to not have uh, people walking around. You intimidate people. Uh, you know, people walking around with a rifle or a gun on their hip intimidates people. Law enforcement can do that, and they should do that. Security cards can, military can, that's fine. But you inject the gun into the, the process, and, and there it is. It's very easily uh, available for somebody to get pissed off, to get ticked off, and to pull out that gun and do something about that. It just that. doesn't happen doesn't in states that, that, that have open carry and concealed carry. It doesn't happen. So what's different about Hawaii that makes you concerned that the Hawaiian citizens here are going to be so much different than every other state in the U.S. that has a shall issue policy? Well, quite frankly, uh, I'm not, I, I haven't looked at your stats on that, but I, I'm concerned. I mean, if you have a state, uh, you have a country like uh, the UK, Britain, they don't allow guns. Nobody's there. Their, their incidents of homicides, their incidents of gun related uh, crimes uh, and things like that are, and injuries are so far down. It's, it's, it's minuscule. That's right, but they also have the highest violent uh, uh, crime rate in the UK. Let me ask uh, the only person who's done a lot of prosecuting in this, in this state, uh, uh, Peter. Carlisle, do you think that um, having the ability to quicker access to a handgun, for example, is there a, do you, are you concerned about, for example, the safety of women in domestic violence situations with the prevalence of guns? I mean, do we know whether in domestic violence cases you see higher death from domestic violence in places where there are more guns? I don't know the answer to that statistic, but I, I can tell you right now that if, if you're taking a look at this in terms of what makes Hawaii difference, 
different. First off, we were the first state that had crystal methamphetamine come here in droves and droves. Uh, that, that particular drug is still available. Uh, and the idea of now loading up a person who's got crystal methamphetamine with a gun Nobody's on their pocket. That. That, that, excuse me. Okay. We don't know whether the guy's on drugs or not. Okay. Nobody's advocating that we arm our crystal meth addicts. Yeah, well, We're saying no, law-abiding citizens they'll, they'll, they'll should do have the ability they'll to protect do it, themselves do it all by from themselves. those criminals that decide well, to carry gonna, those guns stop, okay, 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 already. Okay, okay, one at a time. How are you going to stop crystal methamphetamine addicts from carrying a gun on their person? So we should disarm our citizens so that they're completely vulnerable to those? I'm not saying you disarm them. I'm just not saying that you carry around a gun with you. That basically, that's disarming. That's you know, disarming. No, you're going to have a gun that you can take to the range. You're going to have a gun that you can have in your house. You're going to have and a gun. And how does that affect you? Wait, wait, let let me clear one thing up. Right now, we're not disarming people in Hawaii because they're not armed in, this, in, in that way, right? Right. I mean, you, you could call it disarming, but the fact matter, if we look at the existing law in Hawaii, people are not carrying guns on their person out in public. But there's a huge fallacy in what you guys are saying about how if the populace is armed, they're going to prevent crimes. They're going to pull out their concealed gun when when uh, the shooter at the at the theater uh, uh, blasts the guy who's texting, or or when uh, somebody's walking into Arby's with an AK-47 or something like that. That just doesn't happen. It happens the, almost the, daily. The likelihood. I read two instances today on the net. I'm going to ask you to please stop interrupting, okay? Uh, the, please. The, the likelihood is very low that anybody with a gun uh, is going to be able to prevent a particular crime at a particular time. The likelihood is a lot higher that that person is going to do something with the gun because they're ticked off uh, or they get into a situation where they want to use the gun. So. I, we disagree on that fundamentally. Okay, I'm going to uh, go to our, we're getting quite a pile of, of callers coming in, and maybe this will be a little cooling off period for us. Um, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I like the lively we discussion. Well, this is fun. I'm, I'm in the middle right here. I'm feeling wanna, a little threatened. Yeah. <laughs> you should have no concern. I want to make sure that we, we get, I want to make sure we get through our agenda and our viewers' agenda. That's what I want to make sure of. Okay, so we have Bruce from Kalihi. There is too much regulation. We have too much crime in Kalihi, and the people can't defend themselves. Do you think, um, David Louie, that people would be safer if there were guns available for personal defense? I have like three questions around this. Okay, already. and there already are guns available. So the, the U.S. Supreme Court Good has point. said yeah, you I mean, can have a gun in your home. And people you, in Hawaii can have a gun in their home yes, for self-defense. They absolutely can. Tell me what the restrictions are on that. The, the there's almost no restrictions on that. You just have to be able to get the gun, which is you have to apply uh, for the permit. Uh, there's a 14-day period, and then once the permit is issued, you can go buy the gun, uh, and then you can have it in your home. Uh, the Supreme Court in the Heller case has said that that's the primary thing is, is the defense of, of, of your home is a fine thing to do. You can't restrict that. We as a state cannot restrict that. So let me ask this question. The scenario is, is um, I want to have a gun on my nightstand. Is that okay? Sure. Anyway? Yes. Sure. You can have it under your pillow and play with it all night long if you want to. That sounds significant to me. Isn't that isn't that, isn't that good enough? Well, do you do you stay in your home 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No. We're very active, especially in Hawaii. We're always out and around. We're in our car. We're going to the mall. We're going to all kinds of different places. One of the big things that comes to play that we haven't talked about is, are criminals going to be as likely to attack someone if they have to wonder? Are they armed? They know the criminal is armed. Do they know that the people that they're going to attack are armed? You, you found when Florida enacted the concealed carry that all of a sudden the crime rate started plummeting because now the criminals had to think, well, wait a minute. Am I going to attack you? You might be armed. Another quick question from a viewer about Hawaii laws. and. Um, I don't know that this is true, but it says, I want to know why Hawaii lets tourists come here with assault weapons to go hunting. Is that true? Well, number one, we have to get away from this assault weapon terminology. It's a made-up term, and it doesn't really mean anything uh, except uh, a bunch of legislators who really don't know the mechanics of firearms uh, making up stuff that they think is wrong. Okay, David, what would you call an assault weapon? Uh, something with a high-capacity magazine where you can get off... 10, 15, 20 shots. Just Automatic. by pulling. Automatically. Automatic large magazine. How about we, that? we don't have automatics in Hawaii. It's illegal. Okay, so and it would be illegal. illegal that, so it answer no. the question, Again, although it would be illegal the for the tourists to bring. Is important. 
So if you talk about an automatic firearm, you talk about a, a select fire or a machine gun. Those are illegal for civilians or citizens in Hawaii. And you support that being illegal everywhere? I do not. They're not illegal everywhere. Many states in the U.S. Ha are, uh, you are allowed to own machine guns. Peter? Is, is the thing that you shoot that goes uh, three at a time and three at a time, is that considered a machine gun? Yes, yes. it's called a select fire, that's, yes. Okay, so that's a three machine round gun, burst. too. And that's, that's military. That's completely illegal for, for any civilian in Hawaii. And is that okay with you guys? Why, why would you want to have a gun like that? Why not? How many crimes are committed with machine guns across the U.S.? We know of one, and it was by a law enforcement officer. Um, so the fact of the matter is, is in the states that allow uh, citizens to have uh, fully automatic firearms, the crime rate by them is up virtually non-existent. Uh, so is it just defense, or are you talking about sports shooting with a machine gun? Uh, it, it probably isn't very good for defense. I mean, it, it would be more for sport, certainly. You, you need to have a machine gun to kill a deer? Uh, nobody's talking about sporting in terms of hunting. We're talking about uh, shooting at the range. You can, there's all sorts of competitions uh, that are, uh, many of people in the various states that allow those machine guns have. Uh, matter of fact, I think it's Tennessee yeah. that has an annual machine gun shoot. It draws literally thousands of people from across the U.S. just simply so they can shoot machine guns. It's fun. There is yeah. special licensing for a machine gun. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see somebody, you know, walking around the streets with it. <laughs> That's okay. No. That, that, you guys don't want, want that either? Like, Lori, what restriction would you put on someone who had a machine gun when it came to you carrying it in public? Well, again, if, if you're carrying a firearm for protection, uh, a machine gun is generally not the best. No, no, but thing. that's not really the answer. I'm asking you, what restrictions would you put on people carrying around machine guns in public? Uh, at this point, are the same restrictions as any other gun. So none. Uh, again, do we have restrictions on, on carrying firearms around in Hawaii right now? Uh, we do. Uh, yeah. So, but so. in your world, we would not have that, and you would include the ability to carry around your uh, machine gun. Tell me why it would be a problem. Well, so the reason well, why... Okay, excuse me. So, okay, sorry. There's one of these things... Right okay, stop bugging me, okay? The, <laughs> <laughs> one of the reasons that they have machine guns in the military is to kill other people, and they're highly trained in how to do it and when to do it. And that's not true of the people who are just ordinary citizens. They don't have police training, they don't have law enforcement training, and they don't have training on worrying about back targets and the rest of those things. So I would suggest to you that that's a real concern. And I would suggest to you that the reason the military has machine guns is to usually lay down suppressive fire, which is a tactic in military uh, actions. It's not, if you are aiming to try and kill individuals, you take your firearm off automatic and you use semi-automatic version because aimed fire is much more effective than a burst fire round. Well, I it's, thought suppressive fire laid out basically a cover, you know, of, of bullets that people couldn't get through. To, to keep heads down yeah. is what Bill's down. talking about. I don't about. know a lot of people in Hawaii who are busy keeping their heads down when they're walking around on the streets. Well, I could be wrong on that, but, but that's but my guess. Peter, there are, <laughs> there are tens and hundreds of thousands of these guns in America. There are no problems with them because they're, they're in the hands of legal, lawful, non-felon people. It, oh. takes, it, takes a, it takes a permitting process through the federal government as well as the local government to own a machine gun. Can I throw out a, just a, a, an experience that I had that kind of threw me off? I, again, I've been mostly in Hawaii and, and not involved with gun culture, but I went away to school for a while, and my roommate was an Iowa farmer. And in his farm, they had an arsenal that was just jaw-dropping to me. They had high-powered, long-range rifles, not, multi, they, you know, in some cases I think they could shoot several bullets, but it wasn't machine guns, but for taking care of coyote and predators on their land. They had a shotgun that... Uh, fired multiple, an automatic shotgun for hunting birds. Semi-auto. Uh, you didn't have to pump it. It went boom, boom, boom. Semi-auto, not That's semi-auto. Yeah. Semi oh, one, I see. One you had pull, to pull a trigger. One, one round. Excuse my ignorance on that. But it was just like boom, 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 boom. It was like anti-aircraft fire to me. And, then they, and, and I experienced that, and all of those were tools for the farm. And, you know, fascinating. But... You know, in a rural area, you can see that, but, I, you know, is it that fascination? Is it that attachment to the pioneer life that we have that makes guns so exciting? And that's my question. What is it about Americans and, and this excitement about guns? Can you explain? It isn't just Americans. 
walk down in Waikiki and see everybody from everywhere around the world coming to the gun stores and the gun ranges down there. But aren't those almost always from places where they can't do it at all at home? Well, you, you were saying that there was a fascination only okay. in America. Sure. Not the case. There's a fascination mm -hmm. across the world. And you make a profit at those gun stores because the tourists come from places Absolutely. where they're not and, allowed and, to have guns. And that's not a dirty yeah. word. So, uh, no, know, not at all. And it's okay uh, for people to shoot guns. I'm not against people shooting guns. Uh, I, what I object to is having uh, carry out into the populace because I think it creates dangers and it creates risk. W what I'm not clear on is why you guys feel the need that people can just have guns and walk around and carry them because I, I don't see that there's a problem that we have well, to address. Yeah. Uh, hang on. Yeah, 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 I know it's my don't fault. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know? I'm uh, terrible at this. I saw. I apologize. <laughs> But, but, I mean, you know, we're not addressing a need. If uh, out on the farm uh, y you've got coyotes, you've got predators, you've got to deal with them, I understand that. But in the town of Honolulu, uh, on the island of Oahu, we, we have a small community here. I don't see the need that people have to walk around with guns. Uh, it, it's contrary to me, to the Aloha State, to the culture that we have, and, and I just don't see that it's necessary. So well, we don't have crime on civilians in, in this wonderful town that we live in? Well, we have very, in terms of violent crimes, we have one of the lowest rates in the nation. I know we have it in terms of murder rates, we're at rock bottom. So we have a lot of thefts. And a but, lot of assaults. So, well, the assault issue is... Wait, is you, if someone was assaulting you, would you be allowed to shoot them with a gun? It depends. You are, you are allowed to employ lethal force uh, if you fear great bodily injury or death. There's actually five reasons you can. It's not employ. if you fear it. Yeah. It, it, what is our what is our situation? No, I'm trying of, to think what they. It's not if you fear it. If if that they if they if you if there is a reasonable likelihood that you will be subject to Injured, serious yeah. bodily no serious bodily injury or death. So it's not not your fear that counts. It's whether there's sub. You, I mean. It's Something an objective standard. Yeah, it's an objective standard. Something that you can actually look so at. So that facts. would apply to a baseball bat, a knife, yeah, and yeah, yeah. or a gun. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, in yeah. Hawaii, if you had a gun in your house. Okay, so I had one uh, caller asking, well, what's my rights to use a gun in my house? So in Hawaii, that's another set of laws, right? Uh, the, 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 where somebody comes into my house, can I shoot them? Well, Let me start with David Louis. From, you know, I'm, I, we don't have a stand your ground law here uh, like they do in Florida or some of these other states. So uh, the use of lethal force, I think, and I, I, I'm not going to uh, claim to be an expert on that, but I think you're going to have to have a decent reason uh, before you before I'm, you. Do I'm that. sure Peter Carlos. Well, part, you can protect part, yourself uh, in your house without retreating. Mm -hmm. On the outside, if there is a reason, is that there is a way for you to get away from somebody, you can, you have a duty to retreat. So let's take the baseball mm -hmm. example. You've got somebody who can't walk, and you're perfectly capable of running away, and they're coming at you, and he is bent on give, inflicting serious bodily or injury, and possibly even death. You have a duty to retreat if you can do so. That duty to retreat does not exist in your home. So, so in your home, you can stand your ground. You can do that to protect not only your dwelling, but the people who are in the home as well. So, Bill Richter, is that something that you folks would like to see change? That it be a standard your ground law in Hawaii? I, I know that's slightly off of the field of being gun control, but indeed, if the purpose of having a gun is to protect yourself, do you feel like we're too restrictive on that too? Uh, well, stand your ground laws are, are, are a very broad concept, and it includes everything from not having to make a retreat in your house to some presumptions of, of uh, malintent in these states where, you know, if somebody breaks into your house, you don't have to make a determination. They don't put the onus of determining whether or not that bad guy who's so brazen to break into your house while it's occupied is intent on stealing your TV or stabbing you while you sleep. Um, so the stand your ground laws are, are cover a broad base. Uh, in general, um, I think we need to be a little more uh, proactive in giving the victims of these crimes, the homeowners, these people, this ability to defend their home, their, their castle, if you will, uh, and not making it so difficult to, uh, you know, determine the intent of the intruder when you're woken up at 2 in the morning. Okay, I've done a couple of questions about what is actually in the law. Um, there was a, a mention about, um, I'll put you on the spot, uh, Mr. Carlisle. There's a mention here that they, someone's called and say they've seen you at the range, you have a gun. Do you have a gun? You didn't see me at the range, but I do. I have three guns, and they're all trophies that my father had from World War II. So they're and not. They're they right now in a safe in my house and have not been opened or shot since I've. 
I would say, in quite some time. But I, I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly comfortable, 100% comfortable with people having guns, going to the range, shooting, shooting them, having competitions in the range. I don't think there's anything the matter with any of that. I think the person who has a farm out in Iowa, who has predators and coyotes, I don't know of a farm in Honolulu that has predators and coyotes at them, and we don't have many farms well, at pigs. all. There's pigs, and yes, that's absolutely unequivocally true, and you bring a police officer in and they'll take care of the problem for you. And that's happened in, in my neighborhood. Uh, but I don't want people to think there's a lot of pigs in my neighborhood. Okay, let me talk a little bit about where we go from here. Are you folks convinced, what's the consensus on this table about whether Hawaii's current laws will actually stand given the movement of the, the, the courts, uh, the government, now we've got a Republican Congress. Um, let me start, David, where, where do you think we're gonna go? Are, are our current structure going to be able to hold up against the assaults from the, so, from so, the law. so right now, I mean, there's, look, people who want more uh, or less restrictive gun laws are constantly pushing, and there's a, a push and pull there. So what's happening right now on the law is, is that there is a, uh, a decision that came out of San Diego, which is part of the Ninth Circuit, and it's called the Peruta decision. And what that essentially does is it says you can have, you can, anybody, gets to uh, have concealed carry, okay? That would uh, gut our concealed carry law. Um, that decision is up right now on an en banc, what is called the, uh, the whole Ninth Circuit is gonna look at it. And they decided to, look, so there was a, a panel, three judges in the Ninth Circuit, which covers all of the Western states, uh, you know, federal, it's the federal law, said, no, we're gonna get rid of all these uh, restrictions on concealed carry. That decision is being reviewed right now by a larger en banc or a, a bank of Ninth Circuit judges. I think it's somewhere between eight and 12 judges who are gonna look at that. And that's coming up. Our off, uh, the Attorney General's office just recently filed an amicus, a friend of the court brief on that. And then Hawaii has a, a case right now um, that is very parallel with that, where there was a, a decision based upon that Peruta case. And, and that's all going up in the courts. So, there, so right now that's going up in the courts, uh, you know, and, and we'll see what happens. Uh, it, it's not clear what will happen. There are three other circuits, there are numerous other circuits that have said, we're, we're gonna allow reasonable restrictions on concealed carry, on, on open carry because of the risk. And then, uh, Harvey, uh, where do you think, uh, where do you think we're headed? Do you, are you pretty confident that, um, Hawaii is going to not have these kind of laws before too long? What do you mean, not it, have these kind of basically laws? Basically, they'll be shut down by the, overridden by federal rulings or federal courts. I'm, I'm very confident that that's going to happen. You know, looking, looking at what happened in Peruta, um, and, and it, it, it is under review, but I think that will come out favorable for us and when we'll force the police chief to start issuing concealed carry. Now, David, you made, a, you made a comment that anybody can carry a gun, and that's clearly not the case. You have, to, you have to meet all the qualifications, number one, to own a gun, and then number two, to get a permit to carry it, even, even under, uh, under the Peruta decision. It's not just anybody can carry a gun. Well, the Peruta decision got rid of California's good cause uh, standard. It was, a, it was a standard there, they, they said, you can get a concealed carry permit, but you have to have good cause for it. Now, in Hawaii, we have a similar type of a, a standard which says you, it, it, it's an exceptional case. I mean, so if Peter is in fear of his life or he's in fear of serious bodily harms or there's some kind of a threat and, and it's an exceptional case, you can get a concealed uh, uh, carry permit um, through the chiefs, okay? Uh, and, and I agree with that uh, regulatory scheme because I think the police chiefs can make that determination. If the Peruta case, as it currently was ruled, uh, holds up, um, then that standard is gonna get, actually get thrown out. And um, we, I, I disagree with Harvey. I think that it's yeah. highly likely that the Ninth Circuit is gonna overturn that in an en banc review and that we're gonna, we're gonna allow reasonable restrictions. Peter Keller, what's your read on this? Well, let me, I, I, first off, I haven't been following the law, and I understand that I was speaking to somebody today when I was suggesting legislation regarding guns, uh, said that he thought that that was what was going to happen. But I also want to correct that thing that I said to the person who was talking about me shooting down at the range. I mm. did go shooting down at the range, but it wasn't with my guns. It was oh. with a friend's guns, and I, I'll do that regularly on occasion. So oh, okay. I don't have the slightest difficulty with that and never have. But when you're shooting there, you're not shooting anything living. Let me uh, ask another question, and this is, again, to, to honor our viewers, and uh, they're coming in in all kinds of different angles here, but I'm trying to shoehorn them in when, when, it, when it comes up. When we talk about 
who should be allowed to have a concealed carry. This is a specific question from uh, a person who says, do you think it is right for an elderly or disabled person to carry a gun when they could be easily overpowered and have the gun used against them? It's sort of a, that's a double-edged sword thing. I would think some people who are disabled would want to have a gun because they feel threatened, but on the other hand, you know, uh, let me let me try you, uh, uh, Bill, Bill Richter. Is, would you have a concern about that, 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 that people will have guns that will just be taken away from them and used against them or someone else? That's an extremely rare occurrence, and we know for a fact in all of the defensive gun uses that have been documented that people rarely have their firearms if they choose to go armed uh, taken by them, uh, from them by a criminal. Um, so, no, I, I don't have a concern if, if you have the training, uh, the minimal training necessary for the handgun retention. It's not a problem. As a matter of fact, just last week I think there was a uh, story in the news about a 93 year old lady uh, defending her home with a firearm after it was broken into so um, Is that here no it was on the mainland okay uh, let me ask another uh, question from a viewer um, and this goes to a very important piece of the overall gun control scheme and that is how do we keep track of people who shouldn't have guns right so the question is are we in Hawaii connected to a national registry so that when we do background checks we will catch all criminals. Um, where is the NRA uh, on this issue of national background checks, uh, the, the database? There's real mixed messages that I've heard. One is, well, we, we, we can have these, we can, we can try and prevent people from having guns, but at the same time, but we don't want national databases. I mean, where, where, where are you folks on that? Well, and, and the reasoning for that is that there is a concern that you get this national database and every firearm in America is located on a database such that if the government decides we're now going to confiscate the firearms, they know where every single firearm is. That's where the national concern is on do we, do we have a national database. So people are really genuinely worried that the entire government of the United States is going to leash its troops on everybody and steal their guns for whatever purpose. And, really and how many nations that. across okay. the world has that I'm not talking about Peter. that. I'm talking about the United States. If you really think that that's going to happen in the United States, I would say that that's almost delusional. Really? It's happening yeah, in California? It's happening from having in having a gun, right? It's happening. <laughs> it's, happening. <laughs> it's happening in California now. It's happening yep. in Connecticut Who's now. It happening it's, to? it's happening in New York City. People um, who register. People who registered their firearms. California said, we want to register <laughs> these nasty uh, assault weapons. And uh, several years later, they decided to outlaw them. And they literally went to that registry, that database, and said, you need to turn in those firearms. So or if, go to if jail. the legislature says that they don't want those in, in, the, in the population, what's wrong with them and going and get that specific weapon? Again, most of these firearms laws that are here, including in Hawaii, are made by legislators who have very little actual knowledge of the firearms. Let me give you an example. Why can't we have Teflon coated bullets in Hawaii? Well, I know that they're very effective at going through things. Th that's, that's completely untrue. Okay. It's there to reduce the heat buildup as the bullet travels down the barrel at a slightly higher velocity. Those particular uh, ammunition uh, was manufactured by law enforcement for their use simply because it provided a higher velocity and less friction. It has no, no impact whatsoever on whether or not it defeats body Why, why armor. do people need them? Why, why do you need Why do you need a 300 horsepower uh, Mustang? I don't have efficiency. a 300 horsepower Mustang. Mine's a, mine's a <laughs> it's 222, yeah. so yeah. yeah. And, and fragmenting bullets, let's look at that one as well. Fragmenting bullets would make tremendous sense for so many different uses, but we can't have them here. Okay, what are the, what are the, the sensible uses of fragmenting bullets? You can shoot steel, for instance, in sport. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us shoot steel plate. You've probably shot steel plate when you've, when you've gone to the range and shot your friend's guns. If you shoot fragmenting bullets, they hit the steel plate, you know you had an accurate hit, and they just go poof and they turn into dust. Just, just, just to step in for a second, I feel like I'm listening to another GMO debate where one group is arguing <laughs> here, another group is arguing here, and we're not, we're not, we're not meeting in the middle. The question... Do you really <laughs> expected that? <laughs> I just keep hoping. Okay, okay. I agree with that. <laughs> but, but, okay, let me... But let the me. law enforcement concern with fragmenting bullets is, is that they can cause greater injuries a greater degree of injury if it's used on a person. Then instead of a clean hole, uh, you, you're going to get a, a widening bullet and it's going to take out more organs and you're going to have more collateral damage. That's, That's the yeah, Okay, let me get back to this. I think it was a fascinating point that, 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 that Mr. Carlisle, you folks were, were getting into about this 
concern, getting back to the database, which I think was the question, was, you know, I mean, if you say you want to keep the guns out of the hands of criminals, why can't you have an, isn't the only way to do that with a national database that keeps track of both the criminals and the guns? Uh, where is the, where's the connect? Between what? Between criminals the criminals and, and the database. Well, you want to keep them apart. Well, uh, yeah, but wh where's the connection between the database and the criminals? Well, at the Fine. point of track sale, the, at track the point of sale, right? Well, but or the point of registration. But that's certainly intact here, and it's intact in many and, and, states and where they, okay. they do a national check. They do a NICS check to find out, are you a criminal, before they sell okay, your so gun. we're talking about something different between a database of guns and a database of criminals Absolutely. that can be checked by the people and who sell no, there guns. There shouldn't be an interconnect. But that's okay with you, that everybody who sells a gun has to check a database before they sell it? No. Okay, so that's where I'm getting lost now. So you don't want to have a criminal database people can check against? Um, actually, right now, for example, um, if I make a private sale in Hawaii, I want to sell my gun to uh, Harvey, I have to go through this registration process. In many states, that's not the case. Uh, and you can sell between private parties. So this background check that has recently passed in Washington State, for example, uh, the problem, again, it comes from legislators not knowing the consequences of their actions. Right now in, in Washington State, they've deemed a transfer. If I go to uh, the range with Harvey in Washington State and hand him my gun, that's a transfer under the new law. That Just requires for to shoot a background it. check. So if I take Peter to the range in Hawaii, I can let him shoot my gun. If I'm in Washington state and I'm a gun owner, I cannot do that because I have to get a background check because of that. So the problems inherent with all of this legislation is that oftentimes it's misdirected, it's, it's, for, it's uh, foundation is uh, on a lack of actual knowledge of the firearms or the processes involved. Um, the fragmenting bullets, for example, those are not uh, advocated by uh, police uh, because or the, there's the problem with that is they get confused with exploding ammunition which is illegal really not a much use for but uh, fragmenting ammunition was used by air marshals on planes because it was less likely to penetrate the skin of the uh, airplane so again it, it if you start making all these laws and you're so unfamiliar with the technical aspects of the firearms and the process Inherent is that is is dumb laws. Let me go back. Can, can I ask? Can I ask a sure. question? Yeah. So, isn't it true that I mean, am I wrong? A fragmenting bullet that goes in here leaves a little hole, and out in the back comes this thing that's about the size of your hand. So do hollow points that the police use now. Okay. So they so anybody who has those things can have that effect on a human being. That's the process. If okay. you have a self-defense round, what do you want that round to do? Do you want it to go through the person so that it causes minimal damage, or do you want that round to incapacitate your attacker so that the attack ceases? Okay. Let me. Uh, Keep going. I'm trying to stay on track with this idea of keeping track of people who should have guns and people who should not have guns because we've got a couple of questions along those lines. One of the processes that was developed quite vigorously after the Uesugi killing was uh, a thing that said if you have a set of, you have a, a, a gun collection and uh, you an get arsenal. A, an arsenal well, is what he had. Or one gun too, yeah. either way. But if you have guns and you've registered them and you are found to be now ineligible to have a gun, they go back and they take your guns. I think that's probably the number one activity of our SWAT team is going and taking guns from people who have new TROs against them. Is that okay? Uh, let me start with you, Harvey. Well, it, TROs are so easy to get. And, and there are cases where people that have a TRO against them very probably should have their guns taken away. You know, if they're violent and the TRO is because of, of domestic violence or, or uh, some form of violence. but. I could get a TRO on you in 10 minutes in front of a judge, and that, that takes your gun rights away. And how could you do that without perjuring yourself? And that doesn't happen every day in every court. Well, You've got to have seen it 10,000 times. people perjure themselves? Absolutely. I haven't seen it 10,000 times. Uh, oh, that would And uh, by that the way, if they, if, they do, if they do perjure themselves, then a responsible prosecutor would prosecute them. How many cases of perjury have been prosecuted in Hawaii in the last 10 years? How many Several, TROs have yeah. been overturned because the judge who heard them felt that they weren't justified? 
thousand. And the judges but, have discretion. But the guns to, were confiscated make, already. But yeah. the guy gets it back if it doesn't, it doesn't get held up. After right. he goes to court and gets a special a special directive by a judge. Okay, so that's right. right. He can go into the judge and and get that corrected and 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 figure out what that is. That's what judges are there for. Um, you know, you want. That's why police chiefs are there to regulate the thing. You want somebody responsible to do this. When you have a TRO against somebody, especially with domestic violence incidences and things, there's almost a presumption of, hey, we got to be careful here. We got to watch out for this. And so if somebody has a good case to say, hey, wait a minute, this TRO is made up. Uh, I'm a responsible person. Come on. Th my gun rights should not be uh, in infringed. Uh, that's going to happen. I, I don't disagree with that. So let me uh, next next subgroup. Okay, so we've got domestic violence uh, accusations, losing their guns. We've got people with criminal records not being allowed to have guns. People with mental illness. How, how big a problem is that here? How good are we at really keeping track of it? The the, the case on point there is uh, Mal Gafredo, who got the gun from his landlord, I believe. Uh, and used it to kill three people. Um, are we okay, are you folks okay with preventing people with mental illness from having guns? Absolutely. And one of the things that's happening right now that is a, a real overreach is somebody goes in and says, I want to get a gun permit. And with Kaiser especially, if they're a Kaiser patient, there's a form sent by HPD Firearms Division to Kaiser, and the form says, do you have any records of this person seeing the mental health division at Kaiser? Kaiser makes no election of, yes, this, this kid wet his bed when he was seven years old, or he's, he's got serious mental defect. They send back a, a form that says, yes, we have records. That and, uh, and under that our law, you can go in and get that corrected. If you're the person who's being denied something, you can go in and make a showing uh, that a mental health uh, uh, designation is inappropriate for you. Except Kaiser is saying, your insurance doesn't cover that. You, you can't come to us and say, I want you to tell HPD that I wet the bed or that I'm a potential murderer. They won't do it. Let me, Kaiser let me, let me is, is that not little, addressing that. A little further with you, uh, David Louis, is that is, you know, are there some levels of regulation that do become completely unworkable? For example, uh, I remember when this, this issue came up, there were a lot of mental health professionals that said, I would never allow one of my guys to have a gun because then I, they're going to come back and sue me if, if that guy goes. So they, they, they become so cautious that you do begin to infringe on people's right. I mean, and, don't, and, do you feel and, that's a concern? I, I absolutely agree that, that there are that, uh, there's a wide spectrum of mental health issues, and some people uh, should have guns, and some people should not have guns within that spectrum. Agree. Uh, and but the problem is, is is that in the mental health thing, um, it's very difficult to make that determination on a broad basis. And so my view on that, which I think is the, quite frankly the responsible way that our community and our state has handled that, is to say, look, at any mental health problem, it's a flag, and we're going to have to put. A, essentially a halt to gun ownership with mental health. But if you can come in and show the court that you're responsible, that this mental health thing is not related to that, you can get that corrected. So we have a regulatory scheme that allows that. Let me, another form of mental condition, I'm kind of working through my kind of rough transition here because something that uh, Peter Carlin wanted to talk about is alcohol and drugs. Thank you, and I, and, I, and I think that this is something that we're going to have common ground on, frankly. But in somewhere in, in the neighborhood of 60, uh, uh, excuse me, 26 of the states, they have something that's called reckless possession of loaded firearm while intoxicated, a misdemeanor. Any person who has a personal possession of loaded firearm while intoxicated is guilty of that offense. And very clearly, in, in mind why we have done that with the other great dangerous missile, and that's a car. And if somebody's driving a car, even if they're driving it correctly and there isn't a problem into, that you can see, and they pull them over at the roadside, and they ask them to give them a, a random a DUI test, uh, a field sobriety test, and he flunks it, he's going to be getting himself in trouble with, with the DUI at the very least. But what this will do is it means that if you have on your person a, a firearm that's loaded, and you're intoxicated, you've just committed a crime, and no, we can take that away from you. Not, not to 
commit my cardinal rule and interrupt you, but but in fact, you think that might have prevented the DD? Well, there would have been an, there would Eldridge. have been an, an issue, okay? Because DD is a, in in general a law-abiding citizen, and he was going out with his frat buddy, and he got himself sl snockered, and if he had not done that then he would have probably had, he would at the very least have left the gun in the hotel room rather than going out when he's going to be drinking all life with his drinking buddy. Okay, uh, uh, Bill Richter, please, uh, your opportunity to talk about that issue. Uh, well, uh, since we don't have concealed carry in Hawaii, it seems like it's a pointless law until we do. Uh, the second thing is... It's well, it's not a pointless law if it might have saved Colin Eldridge's life, for example. Uh, the, under the law enforcement, I, I, number one, it was a misdemeanor. Uh, it's a petty misdemeanor. Petty mis misdemeanor. Um, so I think that's, that's a debatable issue. Um, but the fact remains is that here in Hawaii, at this point in time, should we expend limited resources to enact a law that basically has no no reason to exist at this point. But wouldn't Nobody. It, wouldn't it, I mean, in fact, when, when Mr. Carlisle made this uh, proposal, the police union uh, president was the strongest objector, saying, well, wait a minute, they encouraged police officers, and in this case we had a, uh, uh, it was DEA, right? No, DSS. DD? Diplomat, diplomatic, oh, diplomatic security, security yeah, State Department, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and we've got FBI agents, we've got a, we have a, a fair number of people that are carrying, this would affect them. Do you think that, I mean, that's not, how hard is that to enforce, really? If they're, they're law enforcement people, they probably wouldn't drink with their, with their guns. Is that good or bad? Tanari said, Tanari Mahafala, the Shopo chair, said that would be bad because you want those officers out there with their guns able to defend people. And again, and we talked about this a little bit, you're going to have to define intoxicated. Is this, is this the officer, or if it comes to pass that we get concealed carry, is this the law-abiding citizen that goes to dinner with his family and has a beer with his dinner uh, and then goes home? Um, what is intoxication? Where, where does that threshold lie? A guy goes to dinner with his family, has a beer, while he's got a gun on his person that's, con well, in your case, you'd like it concealed. And that's perfectly okay, and uh, there's no reason why we should be worried about him having to make responsible decisions on when to use it and when not. It happens with some regular occurrence I'm in sure many states. I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. They haven't had a problem they, with actually, it. No, they've had a problem with it. They've had a problem with, with uh, hunters going out drunk as skunks. And uh, being we're not in talking about of, drunk as skunks. Sk we're talking okay, about we're talking beer and dinner. Okay, that's okay. Perhaps you don't understand that the phenomenon with drinking is when you start drinking, you tend to continue it. And so somebody who starts out thinking, hey, it's going to be just a night with my buddy, ends up getting snockered, which is exactly what happened with Didi, which is why he didn't uh, agree to take a field sobriety test. Um, so as a result, the answer to that question is, yeah, it's a real problem. You've got some drunk, or, uh, drunk, drunk hunters out in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee, and they're playing around with their firearms and shooting at whatever they see. That's a real issue. And it's as, a real it, issue. As, it is, as it is with driving, Peter. Um, we we it make is, a but distinction. There's a difference uh, between a car which has a function other than to kill things, other than the sports functions that you're talking about. If you've got alcohol, this is a real simple thing to understand. Guns and alcohol don't mix, plain and simple. I would disagree with you. Well, that's and a very frightening thought. <laughs> okay, uh, that was, now next question. This is a very interesting thing, because I think that a lot of times when folks want to attack a regulatory scheme in Hawaii, the first thing they do is say, well, let's get rid of the statewide preemption. Let's make this a county <laughs> issue. Uh, do you feel like, well, this is exactly what our uh, caller ca called in. Mr. Carlisle, so what about the rest of the state, like Big Island? Why do we have to abide by the same rules as Honolulu? Well, the answer is is whether it's something that's under state jurisdiction, and there are some rules that you do not have to follow on the Big Island. But when it comes to drugs and alcohol, then firearms, excuse me, firearms, uh, those are things that are strictly regulated for all the right reasons, and they should be statewide. And frankly, in my opinion, they should be federalized. And, well, and I agree with that. I mean, look at the whole issue there is home rule versus state rule. And our state has made certain policy decisions that certain things are so important that we should have statewide. Uh, so some guy on the Big Island in a farm up out by Wine Mayor or something like and saying, hey, why do I have to uh, act uh, like the guys in Honolulu do? Okay, I'm by myself. I can get along. That's fine. And you know what? In a particular case, maybe they can. But our community has, and the, the United States agrees with the regulatory scheme of if an area is important enough to have state regulation, then you just make it you don't have exceptions to it, and that's essentially the difference. Let me, uh, Harvey Gerwig with the Hawaii Rifle Association. Okay, uh, you've got this 
situation here. What is the strategy? What are you guys going to take in? You, are, is there going to be an effort in this legislature? Oh, absolutely. And then how, what's, your, what's the first thing you want to try and get? Well, there's, there's several things. We, we, are, we are putting out a bill for concealed carry. Um, we are also putting out a... Do you have someone for, who's going to introduce that for you? Absolutely. Who's it's it? written and ready to go. Who's that going to be? Uh, Senator Gabbard. Okay. And, Democrat. and Senator Sloan as well. Okay. Different bills. Uh, same thing. We're also uh, uh, promoting a range protection bill to keep ranges from being closed down, which has been a real issue on the mainland and in, is an issue here on the outer island. You know, the big island doesn't have a decent range. Maui's range is threatened, so we want a range protection bill to protect the ranges that are there now and to help develop other ranges so that there is a safe, organized, clean place for people to go practice their sport. So concealed carry and range protection, uh, is there anything else you'd suggest for this legislature? Knowing knowing how things work in Hawaii, you know, how difficult this is going to be, do you feel like you could pick and choose or just go for the big one? Let's just reduce the whole scheme. Oh, again, uh, Harvey and I are pretty well aligned on that. Our, our agenda for the legislative session this year is concealed carry and range protection, uh, and then defeating any any bills that come up that are, are onerous or otherwise anti-gun. Gentlemen, what do you think will happen? Would they come in with these things? I have no prediction on what the legislature <laughs> will do. And what, if they, they come in with that Wise and there's man. a hearing, Peter Carlisle, what will you do? I, I'm going to have to see what is specifically asked for and what they're going to say, but my, my impression is, is that I do not want to go in the direction where people are going to be carrying concealed weapons. I don't think that that's good for anybody, and I think the idea of con, you know combining that with alcohol use, which you'd love, be happy to do, I think it's outright dangerous. Well, we've had a great conversation today, and uh, and we'll be online after this shortly. But I uh, thank all of you, and I'd like to refer to our audience here next time on Insights. The opening of Hawaii's 2015 legislative session, what we've just been talking about, is less than two weeks away. What hot button issues will galvanize Hawaii residents? Maybe gun control, GMOs, uh, the extension of the Oahu's half percent rail tax beyond the year 2022, all kinds of stuff. How will lawmakers work with the newly elected governor? What should we expect from our lawmakers? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Ahui ho.